Hey everybody, welcome to Skype a Scientist Live. Today we're talking all about sharks and their relatives. Um, chondri chondrichthyans, is that how we say that, that word? Chondrichthyans. Chondrichthyans. So yes. what, who, who all encompasses a chondrichthyan? Okay, so chondrichthyans are cartilaginous fishes. Uh -huh. So any fish that's made of cartilage instead of bone. So you have bony fishes that are our typical fish that we think of. And then we have cartilaginous fishes, which are the chondrichthians. Chondrichthians, chondrichthians. I'd like to say that multiple times to remember. <laughs> awesome, sounds good. Um, so yeah, we're gonna be talking all about that today. Um, tom today is Wednesday. It's Earth Day, happy Earth Day. Um, tomorrow we're gonna be talking about um, like space exploration and how um, like exploring space and preparing for that is kind of like being in quarantine for a while. That's going to be cool. And then on Friday, we're talking about microbes at 5 p.m. Eastern um, with Kat Milligan-Meyer, who is really awesome. She lives in Alaska. Um, and then next week, we're doing all museums. Um, so we've partnered up with the natural, the Museum of Natural History in, um, Los Angeles. And so we've got three folks from there talking to us about um, ancient seafaring uh, maritime societies and uh, the local wildlife in Los Angeles and um, sharks, shark jaws specifically. Um, so with that, oh, also we are a nonprofit uh, organization. So if you can support us in any way, we are completely reliant on donors to keep the ship afloat over here. Um, so you can do that at patreon.com slash Skype a scientist or paypal.me slash Skype a scientist. And now I will hand it over to Jasmine. Okay. Hi everyone. My name is Jasmine Graham. I'm a marine biologist and my specialty is chondrichthians which are sharks, skates, rays, all of those fish that are made up of cartilage instead of bone. Uh, so in case you don't know, cartilage is the stuff that we have in our nose and our ears. So instead of bone, they have very dense cartilage as their skeletal system, which makes them extremely flexible, very agile, which is why a lot of sharks are apex predators. They're very fast. They're very good at what they do. They've been around a long time. Uh, so the sharks first started rising in the Cretaceous period, uh, which is millions and billions and billions and billions of years ago. Um, and they've been around ever since and they actually haven't changed that much. Uh, so they really, they really got it right. When they came into the world, they like had their perfect body form and they just kind of stuck with it. Um, but my interests lie in those sharks and rays that changed a lot. Uh, so I call them bizarre chondrichthians. So hammerheads, for example, have the big wide heads that are called cephalofoils. Uh, and so scientists have been puzzled for a long time. Why do they have heads like that? That is so weird. No other shark's family has anything like that. Uh, so it's just very interesting to me. So that's one of the things that I study. I also study a group of animals called sawfish. Uh, specifically the small tooth sawfish, and sawfish are a type of ray, and um, they have these weird noses called rostra, uh, which that's where they get their saw name from, because it kind of looks like a saw. It's this big, long nose. It's got a lot of teeth, which aren't really teeth. They're actually modified scales, fun fact, um, but they look like teeth, so we call them teeth, <laughs> and um, they use this rostra to just kind of whack fish. So they'll swim through schools of fish and then just like thrash about and impale and injure a bunch of fish. And then they just swim back through and pick up all the stragglers and injured fish and they just swallow them whole. Uh, so that's a pretty cool predator. Like who does that? <laughs> it's weird. You just like, evolved this giant saw on your face that you use to just mow down groups of fish. Um, but they also have other things that they use the saw for. So along the saw, they have these sensory organs that allow them to sense things that are moving underneath. So they're raised. So they spend a lot of time on the bottom, on the seafloor. 
And so they'll just kind of chill out or they'll just slowly cruise and they actually can sense small fish moving underneath them. So they may not be able to see them because they're camouflaged or hidden in seagrass and little crevices and stuff, but they can feel them. Uh, and so that is something that's also really useful. And then of course, it's really good to defend yourself. So if anyone tries to come and take a bite out of you, you got this big weapon attached to your face that you can kind of swing. Uh, so when sawfish are very small, uh, there are sharks that will eat them. Uh, but once they get big, they get to be 16 feet long. So they are huge. <laughs> so at that point, nobody's messing with them. Uh, so they are definitely apex predators whenever they are mature adults. Uh, but what's really interesting is they start out to be about two and a half feet long when they're born. So they're really cute and small. Uh, and they grow pretty rapidly in the beginning. And then that growth rate kind of slows down as they get older. And uh, we think their max size is about 16 feet. There have been fishermen that have said 17 feet, but you know how fishermen can be. Sometimes they get a little exaggerated. <laughs> uh, so that's kind of what I, the, the groups of animals that I'm interested in, these animals that are kind of weird in their body plans or have very, very interesting life histories. Uh, for the hammerheads, I was looking at their evolution. So I studied what's called phylogeny, which is basically like building a family tree, except for with organisms. So finding out what species are closely related and trying to find what species might have shared common ancestors and things like that. And I did this using anatomy and genome sequencing. So I did um, some CT scans, which I actually have some to show. If I can share my screen here. Um, let's see here. Do, do, do. Oh. So let me go. there we go. So this is a scan. So when I first get them, you know, we send them through the CT scanner. This is the same type of CT scanner that you would go through as a human. Uh, the CT, CT scanner was actually located at the Medical University of South Carolina. Uh, and so we send our sharks through this and this is kind of what the scans look like. So obviously these CT scans are designed to scan people that have bones. Uh, so it gets a little messy when it's trying to figure out skeletal structural made out of cartilage. So it starts out kind of being like a, a bear in a snowstorm and you're just kind of like, all right, so there's a lot going on here and then I have to go in and I have to digitally segment, which is kind of like doing a dissection, but on the computer. And so this is what it turns out as whenever I'm all done. So you have the skin layer and then underneath you have all of the different parts of it segmented out. So then I can look at it just like someone would be able to look at all the parts once they've done a dissection. I can look at all the skeletal structures through CT scans and I can do this with museum specimens so I don't have to go out and kill any sharks um, in order to be able to do my study. So these are sharks that everyone can use. They're at the museum and you know they have been sampled for science and we can keep reusing the same thing without having to go out and collect more samples because a lot of the sharks I study are endangered or critically endangered. So uh, that's kind of what I did with the CT scanning. And then um, I did genome. So I was part of the Chondrichthyan Tree of Life project where we're basically trying to sequence all of the Chondrichthians in the world. Um, and so as part of that, I was sequencing DNA and looking at how they were related just by looking at their DNA. And then with the sawfish, I was trying to understand their movement ecology. So the small tooth sawfish is critically endangered. It was listed on the Endangered Species Act in the United States, so it's protected federally. And um, part of that listing means that we are tasked as scientists to try and figure out areas where they're at high risk and determine critical habitat, so areas that have some sort of physical or biological feature that's essential to the conservation of that species. So in order to do that, we have to know where they spend a lot of time. 
Uh, so we didn't know that previously. They used to be found pretty widely all the way up to New York and then all the way along the Gulf, all the way to Texas. We actually used to have another species of sawfish called the large tooth sawfish that has since gone extinct in U.S. waters. It still exists other places in the world, but we don't have them in U.S. waters anymore. So we are down to one out of the two species that we used to have, uh, and their range has pretty much shrunk to just Florida now. Uh, so they're found in southern Florida. And so we didn't really know a lot about where they were swimming, where they were spending all the time. Uh, so in the past 10 years or so, we figured out kind of where their nursery habitats are, so where they are born and where they spend their time when they're really young. And now we are focusing more on the adults because we didn't know a lot about them because they grow and then they start swimming away and we have no idea where they're going. But we have this really cool technology now called telemetry, which allows us to track them. Uh, so for my studies, I use both ac acoustic and satellite telemetry. So acoustic telemetry relies on these things called receivers that we sink down to the bottom. And any time a sawfish comes within a detectable range, which is about 500 meters or so of the receiver, we get a ping on the receiver and it saves that information. It will tell us exactly what time, what day, and it will tell us exactly what transmitter it was. We can actually link it to each specific sawfish. Uh, and then we, it pings every two minutes or so. So as long as it's there, it'll keep pinging on that receiver. And then once it swims away, obviously we can tell that it left that area because we don't have any record of it anymore. Um, so that's really cool because you can put receivers in lots of different locations that you think they might be and tell how much time they're spending there, when they come into those areas and things like that. But when they're not by a receiver, you don't know where they are. So the satellite data kind of helps us overlap that missing information. So the satellite data, it stays on them um, we put it on them externally. It stays on them anywhere from 60 to 150 days, depending on how long we program it. Uh, and then once its time is up, it will pop off. So the whole time that it was on the sawfish, it was recording um, temperature, light, depth, things like that. And then it's using that to kind of tell where it is in the world. And so it gives an estimation of where it has been the whole time. Uh, and so when it pops off, it transmits all of this information to the satellite. And so then we can figure out where they were the entire time that we were tracking them versus the acoustic, where we only know where they are when they're by one of our little receivers. So I use both of those types of telemetry to kind of tell where they were moving and identify some places that were really important to them. I also looked at the risk for bycatch in fisheries. So whenever commercial fishermen go out, sometimes they will accidentally catch them. They're not purposefully targeting them, but they'll accidentally catch them. This is especially bad in the shrimp trawls because uh, they're really prone to getting very tangled up in those because they have these big long things on their face. And once they get tangled up, unfortunately, they usually don't survive. Uh, and so, it's pretty fatal for a sawfish to be caught in a shrimp trawl. So we try and mitigate that as much as possible uh, by looking at where the commercial fishermen are fishing and where the sawfish are spending a lot of time. And uh, hopefully through policies and regulations, we can kind of make sure that the fishermen aren't fishing in areas where the sawfish are when they're there. Um, so either fishing at different times when they're not there, if they're only there at specific seasons, or fishing in other areas where they perhaps don't spend as much time. So that's kind of what I do. I'm very interested in sharks and rays, and I've kind of stumbled upon sharks and rays. I knew that I wanted to be a marine biologist, I guess, since high school. Um, I knew that I loved the ocean as a kid, but I didn't know that you could make that a job. And then I found out in high school, you can make it a job. And I was like, oh man, that's so cool. Um, so then I decided to 
become a marine biologist. And it's the best decision I ever made. And I love it. I get to do so many different things. I get to go out on boats. I get to do these CT scans. I get to track things. I get to do a lot of statistics and modeling. And I get to write papers. I get to talk to a lot of people about how great sharks and sawfish are and help with the conservation of some of these species that um, are endangered and critically endangered and that's just really fulfilling. So I'm very pleased with my choice to become a marine biologist and hopefully some people out there are thinking about becoming a marine biologist and if you are, come join the club. It's a fun club. Awesome. All right, so we've got lots of questions here. The first question is, were there chondrichthians before sharks? Were there chondrichthians before sharks? Yes. Uh, so there were things that weren't quite sharks that later became sharks. <laughs> Sounds good. Um, what is your favorite type of shark? Ooh, that's a tough question. I think my favorite shark is a bonnet head. Um, and so I actually have some bonnet heads here in a jar. Oh, there we go. Uh, so they are super cute. They're a type of hammerhead. They have these little little heads that look like bonnets, hence their name. But they're just very cute and they're very, I don't know, they're very charismatic for sharks. They have very expressive faces and they kind of just bumble around and they're cute. <laughs> awesome. Um, solid answer. They are silly looking and so cute. Um, let's see. Uh, <laughs> So how did you get to where you are now? Like, where'd you go to college? Um, and how would you make that happen? So I went to college at a small liberal arts college called the College of Charleston in South Carolina. And um, while I was there, I did a lot of research. I tried a lot of different things in marine biology. I did marine microplastics. I did ocean acidification. I did marine mammal stranding. I tried lots of things. Um, but I just kept coming back to sharks and rays. Uh, so that was what I was really passionate about and what got me really excited. Uh, so then I went on to do graduate school. I got my master's at Florida State University uh, just to get you know, some more knowledge. Uh, and then now I'm working at Moat Marine Lab um, down in Sarasota, Florida, and I'm having a blast. Awesome. Um, is scuba diving something you'd recommend someone do if they want to go into your field? Um, it definitely helps. Uh, there are a lot of things that you can do, a lot of projects where you get to dive, which is, I mean, just really cool for anyone, even if you don't want to be a marine biologist. Like, if you have the opportunity to scuba dive, highly recommend it. Because, <laughs> um, I mean, it's, there's a whole world down there that you don't see. Um, so anyone should do it but if you're a marine biologist yes there are obviously a lot of things that you can study down there and it will help I will say it's not a requirement so there are lots of things that you can do on boats or in the lab uh, so if you for whatever reason can't dive maybe you're claustrophobic or you have some other thing that makes diving unpleasant uh, there that's definitely not doesn't mean that you can't be a marine biologist. You can do work on boats. You can do work in the lab. Um, pretty much, you, there's so many options with marine biology that um, don't feel like you have to be limited to like all marine biologists study coral and scuba dive. That's not true. Lots of marine biologists do lots of different things. I'm a squid biologist. I'm a marine biologist, and I I, I can dive, but I haven't gone scuba diving in like ten years because it's just not necessary for what I do. Yeah. Um, and uh, I have been broke for the last 10 years and couldn't afford <laughs> scuba diving for fun. So it just didn't happen. Um, all right, next. Oh, how long does it take to finish one of those scans that you showed us? Um, that depends. So some scans turn out a lot better than others, depending on how old the sharp array was. Uh, so the older they are, the more dense their cartilage is and the more similar it is in density to bone. So the CT scan picks it up a little better. Uh, so juveniles are really hard to segment because some of the things don't, the structures are all bleh. 
so the easiest scan would probably take me about six hours. The hardest scan that I've done, I think, took me four days. Wow. Um, the next question, do sharks purposefully attack people? They do not. Uh, so sharks, I, they have this bad reputation of being like these man-eating machines, uh, but they're really just like any other animal. They're just out there living their lives, um, trying to eat, trying to mate, and unfortunately sometimes people get in their path and they get confused. Uh, and so a lot of times whenever we have a shark encounter, uh, I prefer the word encounter versus attack because attack kind of makes it sound like they're doing it on purpose. Um, but whenever we have an encounter, usually it's uh, mating season or there was some sort of feeding frenzy ar around where the person was and they just happened to swim in a bad place. Um, and so I think that it's really important to recognize that they're not purposely trying to do it and they're not being malicious and um, they, a lot of people have this perception that sharks are dangerous, uh, which is true, but they're not any more dangerous than a lot of other things out there. People bring dogs into their homes. I have a dog. Dogs attack people much more frequently than people get attacked by sharks and we keep them as pets and put clothes on them. So, <laughs> um, yeah, it's definitely a bad misconception of sharks that has really been detrimental to them. There's a lot of people that kill sharks on site and do all kinds of things because they think sharks are just maniacs that are going to attack them. And we're more, a lot more dangerous to them than they are to us. We kill hundreds of thousands of sharks a year and shark fatalities uh, are like one, one in the world every year, one or two, and we kill hundreds of thousands of sharks. So they should be much more afraid of us than we are of them. For sure. Awesome. Um, so when you have these telemetry tags on, um, or I don't know if it's the telemetry tag or the depth uh, and temperature sensing tag, but after they pop off the shark, can you retrieve them? Uh, yes, in an ideal world, you can retrieve them, and you get a lot of information if you are able to retrieve them, um, because not all of that data is submitted to the satellite. Some of it is saved on the tag. We get all of the like basic movement data and depth and temperature, but um, depending on the tag, you could have accelerometers, which are tell you, telling you how fast they're swimming at any given time, and there's other sensors on there. Uh, so if you can recollect the tag that's great we try to if they're in a location that we can get to um, sometimes they pop off and we they'll actually wash up on the beach and we have a little um note or whatever taped on it <laughs> so if someone finds that they can call us and so we've had some people like oh i found this weird thing on the beach it has your phone number on it thanks we needed that um, but yes, they do send their location uh, for a week or two after they've popped off so that you could ideally find them. Um, but once their battery dies, there's no way we could find them because it can't tell us where it is. Uh, so we don't recover all of them. Um, we don't recover a lot of them, but we do try to recover them when possible. Awesome. Um, Cooper would like to know, uh, what's the largest marine animal you've ever seen in the wild? that I've ever seen in the wild. Um, so I've seen a North Atlantic white right whale, uh, which Whoa. is the, probably the biggest. I went on a whale watching tour and I saw it. It's probably the biggest that I've seen. And probably like the most <laughs> endangered, right? I mean, yeah. holy moly, that's awesome. Uh, cool. I, I think my biggest is humpback. I've seen yeah. a lot of humpbacks, but I've never seen a North Atlantic right whale. Um, that's pretty exciting. How many species of sharks are there? Uh, that is a excellent question. There are about 400, somewhere between 400 and 475 uh, known species of sharks. We keep discovering more and um, every, pretty much every year we discover more. 
Uh, so that's not to say that those are the only species out there. Those are the only ones we know about. <laughs> awesome. Um, so it's Earth Day. Uh, what can we do uh, as regular people uh, to either help uh, the sawfish that seems like it's having a tough time or just sharks and rays in general? Uh, so ways that you can help sawfish. Um, so sawfish, they are very prone to entanglement. Uh, so if anyone is a fisherman or their parents are fishermen or anything like that, um, encouraging them not to leave their monofilament or nets or anything lying around um, that they can get tangled up in um, because unfortunately a lot of sawfish have been found dead with fishing gear wrapped all around them. Uh, for sharks in general, I think that just an awareness of sharks and the, that they're, they're cool and uh, that they're, they're not out to kill everyone. Uh, that's probably the best thing that you can do. Uh, and then just general things that help pretty much all marine mammals, reducing plastic and not using mylar balloons, um, things like that, not littering, because that ends up in our oceans. It's not good. It's not good for anything in the ocean. Uh, so those are basic things that you can do that pretty much benefit all marine animals. Awesome. Um, let's see. Uh, do sharks communicate with each other? Katie, age nine, would like to know. Uh, so they do. We don't understand how exactly, um, but they do. So they're not like, so you know, humpback whales, they make these, these songs, their sounds. Uh, sharks don't necessarily make sound. I mean, they, they make some sounds, but they don't seem to have any rhyme or reason to them, to us. Um, but we think a lot of it has to do with electromagnetic pulses. So they have these sensors that are really good uh, at sensing electromagnetic magnetic fields. So they could be in some way manipulating that or interpreting it in some way that helps them communicate. Uh, we do have some, a lot of sharks are solitary, but there are sharks and rays that hang out together. And so if they're in a group, they, they have to be able to find each other, we think. So uh, they must be communicating in some way. Um, there's a lot of body language things that they do, especially during mating season, uh, to kind of initiate mating. And that's, you know, that's a form of communication, nudging, nipping, things like that. Um, sharks are actually really smart. <laughs> a lot of people don't think about it. They, you know, they have the mindless killing machine thing, um, but they're very intelligent. Uh, they can be trained. So at Moat, we actually feed our sharks um, at different stations. So we put different colored shapes in the water and they know what shape to go to. Each individual has their own designated place to go to eat. Um, and they follow the shape to figure out where they need to go to go get their food. Um, and our founder, Jeannie Clark, actually was the first person to figure out that you could train sharks. Uh, and so obviously there's a lot going on up there that we don't realize. And they probably are communicating with each other and we just don't understand it. <laughs> For sure. Um, let's see, is the shock of the Atlantic torpedo ray enough to kill a human? Um, I don't, I don't think so. I'm not positive about that one. I'm not, I'm not very sure about what level of shock the human body can take, to be honest. Uh, I know that those things are really powerful, but I don't know if it would kill you. Yeah, I, I think it, you definitely would be having a bad day. Um, and if you were swimming, it probably would harm you enough that you wouldn't be able to swim back to the surface, which would then kill you. I don't know if the shock itself would kill you, but the resulting effects probably would. Nice. One time I was out squid fishing um, and we accidentally caught one of those. And they're like, for anyone who doesn't know, they're these like, imagine like a huge dinner plate that's like, I don't know, three feet across with like a tube and then a club at the end. And they're all gray. They're very nondescript and kind of like tough looking. And the captain of the ship was like this 
65, 70 year old guy, very like sea weathered. And he just like grabbed it and whipped it back into the sea. And it was one of the most amazing things I've ever seen. <laughs> um, and anyway, that's, I, I digress. We'll go back to uh, legit questions about sharks. Um, why are nurse sharks called nurse sharks? Uh, that's really funny. Um, so there's a lot of different theories. Uh, so the theory that I think makes the most sense to me anyways is, so whenever they're eating, I don't know if you've ever heard a nurse shark eat, Sarah, but they like make this thing. Uh, and so one of the theories is that because of that, it sounds like they're nursing. Uh, and that's the, that's the theory that I think makes the most sense. There's a couple different other theories out there, but that's the one I'm going to go with. <laughs> that makes the most sense to me too. Um, let's see. Uh, da, da, da. what's the fastest shark? Uh, the short fin mako is the fastest shark. Uh, so in terms of like sustained speed, they can swim about 25 miles per hour. But if they're chasing something uh, with short bursts, they could actually swim up to like 45 miles per hour for short periods of time. Cool. What's the smallest shark? The smallest shark is the dwarf lantern shark, we think anyways. Um, who knows? Uh, so the dwarf lantern shark is a deep sea shark. There's all kinds of things in the deep sea that we don't know about. So there very well might be something smaller than that. We just don't know. Uh, but the dwarf lantern shark gets to be about eight inches long. Itty bitty. <laughs> I saw one of those at, when I was visiting Scripps, and I they like caught it by accident, and they just like had it swimming around in the tank, and I felt like I had seen a celebrity. Like I couldn't believe <laughs> I saw a live one of those. They're like they're so cute, and they're like purple. They're so like they're just beautiful and weird. Um, are there any sharks that are close to extinction? Uh, unfortunately, there are a lot. <laughs> uh, yeah, there's quite a few endangered and critically endangered sharks. We have lost a couple shark species already. Um, yeah, there's, there's a lot of sharks that aren't doing, doing well, particularly sharks that um, previously experienced a lot of pressure from fisheries, so people catching the sharks for different leather, food, you name it, all kinds of things. Um, so yeah, unfortunately there's a lot of them that aren't doing great. Um, how big is a baby whale shark? How big is a baby whale shark? Oh man, that's a stumper. Um, yeah, yeah, about, I would, this big. I just saw a picture of one like literally yesterday on Twitter. So I, only they're, know this because I learned this literally yesterday. Yeah, they're very, they're, yeah, they're quite small considering how big they grow. Um, yeah, I can't give you an exact number, but yeah, we'll go with Sarah's like. Yay big. <laughs> um, does a shark's skin help it swim faster? It does. So they are super hydrodynamic. Uh, so they have these modified scales that are called denticles. Uh, so if you think about a, like a bony fish scale, they're very thin, you like see through them. They're usually like round or ovular. The shark's denticles are actually like little jagged things uh, that increase hydrodynamicity. It also makes their skin very rough. So if you've ever touched a shark, which I don't recommend touching a wild shark, but if you've ever been somewhere where it's safe and there's captive sharks and you were able to touch them, <laughs> uh, they are very rough if you run your hand in the opposite direction. And then they're a lot smoother if you run with their body plan. So like the way that they would be swimming. Uh, and so that increases their hydrodynamicity. Uh, the shark skin is very tough, like very tough. As someone that handles sharks a lot in the field, uh, they yeah, their skin's very rough. We get what's called shark burn, which is like carpet burn times like 20. Uh, and if a shark rubs you the wrong way when it's like fighting you or whatever, it can make you bleed. It's like, yeah. Oh, no. <laughs> <It's> unpleasant. <laughs> wow. Um, 
let's see. Are there any sharks that can go into fresh water? Yes. Uh, so the bull shark is the famous uh, shark that goes into fresh water. And the way that they do this is they have an organ uh, that maintains their salt content in their body. So the big problem with saltwater animals going into freshwater is that the salt concentration would be diluted because all of the salt would leave their body and move towards the freshwater because there's not a lot of salt in the freshwater. Uh, and that causes all sorts of problems with the, cell, the cells. But the, shark, the bull shark actually has this gland that helps it maintain and hold in their salt so they don't lose it to the fresh water and that allows them to go in fresh water very easily. Uh, bull sharks can swim all the way up rivers. There's you know, reports of bull sharks that have actually like stayed in rivers and villages for long periods of time and like kind of made that their home. Uh, they will, you'll see them sometimes jumping up river rapids, kind of like salmon, except for they're like bull sharks. And that's pretty wild to see. Bull sharks do all kinds of crazy things. They're really cool animals. Bull sharks are so cool, but they also uh, strike fear into my heart. Even if I, I know, like logically, I know I'm not afraid of sharks, but uh, the, the lizard brain within me is a little bit afraid of sharks, um, particularly bull sharks, because I read this book one time about them coming up to up into Jersey, like New Jersey. Uh, yeah. yeah, very spooky. Um, <laughs> let's see. Uh, how do you tell the age of a shark? Um, that's a good question. So the easiest way to tell without killing them is uh, their size. So for a lot of our species that we've studied a lot, we have built models of their growth, so their growth curve. So we know that at this size, they are probably about seven or eight years, or at that size, they're probably only two years, and things like that. That's the easiest way to tell, is by their size. So when we're out in the field and we're just kind of estimating maturity, we usually go off of size, or if it's a male shark, we go off of how calcified or like tough their claspers are. Um, so yeah, the, the easiest way without killing them is uh, size. Sounds good. Um, let's see, A to age seven would like to know, do fish eat algae off sharks? Yes, so there are a bunch, there's a bunch of like symbiotic relationships that sharks have with other critters in the water. Uh, the most famous is the shark sucker, the remoras, um, which I mean they just kind of hitch a ride and they're, they just like eat all of the like stuff that comes off whenever sharks are eating, which is like pretty awesome strategy. <laughs> the like per perfect mooch. Uh, so yeah, there's a lot of um, things that live on sharks and some of them are parasitic in that they like damage the shark, but a lot, there's a lot of like symbiosis with sharks and other critters that just kind of like clean them off or will swim in their, their mouths and kind of like pick stuff out and all kinds of things like that. Awesome. One time uh, I was swimming in Belize, I was looking for squid and a remora came up and just stuck to the bottom of me and it was so weird and so cool. <laughs> I felt like I had a little buddy for that day. Um, let's see, uh, what shark can live the longest? Uh, so I believe that title belongs to the Greenland shark. I think it recently got that title, like maybe a year or two ago. Uh, we don't actually know how long it lives, but we're pretty sure it lives longer than everything else. <laughs> a really long time, like 400 years or something. Yeah. Unbelievable. Um, let's see, do sharks ever go into shallow water? Yes, they do. Um, a lot of sharks, a lot of sharks love shallow water. Uh, so the bonnethead, my favorite shark, they spend a lot of time in shallow water. Very shallow, actually. Um, you can walk in like knee high water and they'll be like bumping into your legs. They just kind of bumble around. Uh, and there are actually some sharks that can live in low oxygenated water. Like the epaulette shark actually can sit in basically like a puddle and it like just chills and it's fine. And it just waits for the tide to come back in. And it's like, all right, I'm gonna go back about that my business. Uh, so yeah, some sharks don't need very much water at all to survive. They just kind of just wait 
till conditions get better. <laughs> That's awesome. Now, on, on May 6th, we're going to be talking to a scientist uh, who studies epaulette sharks. Nice. Uh, or Jackson's sharks, sharks that look a lot like epaulette sharks, if not epaulette sharks. Um, and we also see baby hammerheads when we're out squidding. And squidding is like, yeah, very shallow knee depth. Yeah. Color. And they're so cute. So cute. Um, <laughs> so cute. Okay, we try to keep these sessions to 45 minutes, and we've already been talking about sharks for 40 minutes uh, because there's so many things to say about sharks, and they're amazing. So um, we like to end every session with the same two questions. The first question is, uh, what is something that you wish everybody in the world knew about your area of expertise? And the second question is, what's something that you wish everybody in the world knew about literally anything? It can be as silly or significant as you'd like. Hmm. Okay. Um, things that I wish people knew about marine biology. Uh, I wish people understood how valuable and important our marine resources are. Uh, I think it's very easy to take our oceans for granted because when you're just looking out from the beach, it just looks like water. But there's, there's so much more going on. Uh, it's most of our planet. Obviously, we should be paying attention to it. Uh, there's so much going on beneath the surface. There's plankton, which are providing the majority of our oxygen. Phytoplankton is. We think about trees. and like, yeah, trees are important. But the underdogs, the phytoplankton, putting in the hard work <laughs> to make oxygen on this planet. Um, and then, I mean, there's just so many things that I think are underappreciated and we just take it for granted. And so I guess that's the, the biggest thing that I wish people would research and find out about is all of the important things that the ocean gives to us. And wow. then, Things that I wish people would know in general. I wish people would be able to acknowledge what they don't know and seek out information from people that do know. Uh, and that I think goes across like so many different things. Like if you don't know, it's fine. It's fine to say that you don't know. I like I am a scientist and a lot of times people come and ask me questions about other areas of science that I'm like yes I'm a scientist that doesn't mean that I know physics I I don't know I don't know <laughs> and I will be the first to tell them like yes I am a scientist yes I have an advanced degree that does not mean that I know everything and I am more than willing to pro point you in the direction of someone that does know and I'm not going to say that I know something that I don't know and I think that if everyone took that approach and everyone was willing to listen to people that know more about certain things than them, the world would be a much better place. <laughs> I couldn't agree more. I, I think that's so, so important. And that's kind of what we're trying to do with Skype a Scientist, to show people that, like, I might know about squid and you know about sharks and then somebody else knows a lot about, like, butterflies. And it's okay. We're all working as a team and a group and there is no one, like, Bill Nye, who knows literally everything, you know, like we're all working together to figure out the truth of the way the world works. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, finding the expert and admitting you don't know is so, so important. So thank you for that answer. That's such a good answer. Um, <laughs> And now we're almost at 45 minutes. So thank you everybody for joining us. Thank you for sharing your knowledge with us, Jasmine. This was so, so cool. I love sharks. Thank you, Aaron, for signing for us. Um, and thank you all of you for joining us today. Um, if you can support our program, please, please do. Uh, Patreon.com slash Skype a Scientist and PayPal.me slash Skype a Scientist. We are a nonprofit, so all of your donations are tax deductible. And uh, we're just out here trying to put science in connectivity with as many humans as possible. So uh, if you think our work is important, please, please support us. We really need the help. Um, and we'll see you tomorrow uh, talking about outer space and how exploring outer space is kind of like uh, sitting in your house by yourself, in a sense. Um, thank you again uh, for Jasmine and Erin, and we'll see you later. Bye. Bye.